So here are the topics we need to address. Let's transition them from the .NET framework to Visual Studio .NET. Find out what do we need to have installed in order to just run .NET, and what do we need to have installed in order to use Visual Studio. Then we'll look at concepts that are replete throughout Visual Studio, and that is using classes, namespaces, assemblies. We will look at types, the new type system within .NET. We'll look at the object orientation features a little more closely, and then we'll start looking at the language support in a little more depth. So one of the most common questions I'm asked is, well, what do I need to install in order to run .NET applications? The truth is, there's a .NET SDK that you can run on, let's say you have a .NET application you want to run on a web server. You would install the .NET SDK on that web server, and you would be ready to run your .NET application. Your .NET application would already have to be designed through some other mechanism. And people, before Visual Studio went into beta, people were already creating applications using TextPad. So they'd open up TextPad, put in there all of the code that they needed, and then compile those using some command line utilities, run them on an app on a application server somewhere that had the .NET SDK installed. So this is the way we could do it. Of course, Visual Studio makes this a whole lot easier than doing everything we do inside of Notepad or TextPad. So to use .NET CLR and so on, all we need is the .NET SDK. It will give us the CLR, the whole execution environment, memory management, uh, the forms and control support that we need. To create .NET programs, to create an installation program, to in all of that, we have to install Visual Studio .NET. This will give us an IDE, which is our integrated design environment, uh, development environment. So we'll get an IDE, we'll get the language tools, we will get a lot of utilities, we'll get setup projects and other things that we can create. So using Visual Studio makes creating .NET programs and Windows programs, web programs, so on, web, web, web services a whole lot easier. Now within Visual Studio, we need to understand this notion of classes, that there, there are blueprints for components in our applications. Classes are blueprints like a blueprint of a house. So you see in our image here uh, the image of a house. And uh, ultimately, that blueprint can be used to create an actual house. That blueprint could be used over and over and over again to create identical versions of the same house. We could then take that house, and somebody may say, well, you know, I, I really want this bedroom to be turned into an office. And so they may change some of the aspects of that room but structurally it will remain the same. Or they may say, well, you know, uh, our kitchen, we didn't like it this way, we want the countertops to be a different way. Blueprints allow us to have this same identical version created, but then it can be extended and augmented and supplemented later on. Classes in whatever chosen .NET language we use support full object orientation. So the blueprint could be used to create one class and that could be inherited, actually, to derive a child class written in a different language even that could have a different implementation of the interfaces that we have. So classes, very important concept to know inside of Visual, Visual Studio. Namespaces are another important, is another important concept. Basically, what namespaces allow you to do is to logically group your function calls. So if you look, you have a system.data namespace a system.xml namespace. There's a system.windowsforms namespace. Each of these then groups a whole set of functionality within it. It's also nice because within the namespace, you can provide some scope. You can create your own namespaces within your applications. The ones I've mentioned so far, system.data, et cetera, are namespaces provided within the .NET framework. You can create your own namespaces. So if you have some custom application you're creating with your own classes and so on, you could create a namespace for my app. Later on, if you wanted to create the, another class that has the same name but is a completely different class, all you would have to do is put that class in a different namespace and its scope will be different. So you don't have to worry about conflicts between the two classes that have the same names. This is pretty important. In Visual Basic, you'll use import 
to do shortcuts of namespaces. Sometimes these namespace long names can be very, very long. And so by using the import keyword, we can shorten that up. In C Sharp, you'll use using. In Visual C++, you'll use using namespace. And this is how you can reference them in a little uh, more aliased fashion. Assemblies are another important concept inside of Visual Studio. They're a lot like DLLs, the way we are accustomed to using them in previous versions of Visual Studio. Assemblies are the actual physical files of application functionality. So these are managed DLLs, however. They run within the context of the CLR. What's great about assemblies, so after you create your application, you will compile it, and you will have some assemblies that will be the final product of the building of your application. What's great about assemblies is that they're completely self-describing, which means that they do not need to be registered inside the registry. There's a common phrase that most of us who've developed in Windows for any length of time are accustomed to hearing, and that is DLL hell. I've spent a lot of time there, and basically what happens is in previous versions of Windows development, what we would do is we would compile applications and then have to register our DLLs inside the registry. Unfortunately, as you do different versions of your application and so on, the registry might get a little messed up. It doesn't know which version it should be using. It thinks it's using one version, but the actual file that's sitting out there is for a different version. So they get out of sync. It sometimes gets more complicated than that, but that's a simple way of looking at it. If you were to compile the DLL and the DLL itself had all of the information it needs for any consuming application to understand what it does, that's what an assembly does. So it has metadata, data about itself, embedded within it. And so as a .NET application approaches it, it will be able to understand automatically what this, by, by looking at this metadata, what this, uh, what this DLL does. And it's a lot like type library information without having to use an actual type library or some kind of interface definition language. So all of the files in an assembly, because our assembly may have more than one file, must be in the same directory as the manifest file. So there's this manifest file, which has some information about the metadata and so on. And they just need to be grouped together. So it, within this assembly are things like types, the actual execu executable code, as well as references to other assemblies. Assemblies and namespaces work together. One namespace can span across more than one assembly. So you may have a specific namespace that could have a number of DLLs that provide the application services that a person will see as they navigate within the namespace. Looking a little more closely then, an assembly is really a unit of organization within the .NET framework. All of your code has to be in this assembly if the CLR hopes to run it. These Assemblies are the construct used by the runtime to locate and load the different types that your application will use. They're also a deployment unit because they're physical files. So they, they circumscribe your classes, your versions of your functionality, your security context. And again, they're a unit of deployment. It's something that you can actually take and move onto a machine. We've mentioned types a couple of times. And in now in the .NET framework, as you go in Visual Studio, you'll notice that there's a common type system. No matter which language you use, you're actually going to be using the same underlying types. The common type system defines how these types are declared, how they're used, and then how they're ultimately managed within the runtime environment. All your languages share the same types that are type safe and they're object oriented. There are really two kinds of types. There are value types and there are reference types. Value types work in the following way. When you assign a value type to a variable, what it's going to do is create a copy of the value that's being assigned. It stores this on the stack and not on the heap. It stores it then as a representation of the value. So each instance has a copy, its own copy of the data. Value types include built-in data types, user-defined types, and enumerations. These are all in contrast to what are known as reference types. In reference types, when you assign a variable to this reference type, it will copy the reference rather than the actual data. 
An important distinction of reference types is that they're fully in, they're inheritable, whereas value types are not inheritable. So these are also stored on the heap rather than on the stack, an important distinction between the way value types and reference types work. As you work with Visual Studio, you may also hear about what are known as primitive types. Primitive types are really not a, a new type. They're just another way of describing types that are already there. These are data types that allow you to use keywords to refer to predefined structure types. So for example, system.string, rather than have, having to write out system.string every time you want to use that data type, you can just say string. Instead of saying system.int32, you can just say integer. So there are different types, uh, there are different types of primitive types. Kind of an awkward way of saying it, but it's true. So these are some, some things to look uh, out for. As we've talked about object orientation, we've covered it at a pretty high level. Now what we want to do is look more closely at what it really means to have object orientation support inside of Visual Studio.net. So we will look at inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. There are other aspects like association and other things we could look at within object orientation, but we'll keep it fairly narrow so that we can focus more on how we're ultimately going to use these inside of Visual Studio.